Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We've got a we've got a wonderful uh, session this after this late morning. This is our second session. Um, offshore wind. Welcome back for everyone that's joining us right now. I'm sure we'll have some more people join us as we get going here. Let's get started. Uh, our our second session of the morning: Can offshore wind in federal waters be responsible? Um, that's our topic set today. I'm pleased to introduce and thank our coordinator of this panel, um, Zar, uh, excuse me, Carl Zatella. And Carl has extensive experience in the renewable energy sector with 32 years as a senior staff at the Sierra Club and NRDC. He also served as the chair of the Environmental Data Task Force for the Western Electricity Co Coordination Council, served on the Western Governors Association Transmission Planning Project, and was the vice chair of the Department of Energy's Electricity Advisory Committee along with a whole number of other notable committees. He works with regulatory agencies and consults for organizations and companies in large scale clean energy and transmission projects. So thank you very much, Carl, for moderating this, moderating it this morning. Um, and, and please take it away, it's all yours. Thanks, Howard. I uh, appreciate that very much. Thanks to PCL for inviting me. Um, as we begin, one thing I think we need to keep in mind uh, is, and we're talking about offshore wind in particular, and all renewables really is the enormity of the task before us. For example, California needs three times more power capacity to reach 100% clean energy by 2045. The goal is technically feasible, but only with a vastly accelerated pace of construction. We need to build six gigawatts annually for the next 25 years. One gigawatts, a thousand megawatts to give you an idea of the scale. That's a lot of energy. The state's built on average one gigawatt of utility solar and three tenths of a gigawatt of wind every year over the last decade. In the past three years, the pace has sped up somewhat. We're doing about four gigawatts annually now. This is still far, far short of what we need to build. A new state mandate requires 60% of California's power supply to come from renewables by 2030. That's nearly double the amount we have today. And according to the California Energy Commission, by 2045, solar and wind combined must quadruple. That's about 69 gigawatts from large scale solar farms up from 12.5 gigawatts, plus triple the amount of the rooftop solar that we have today. State officials predict that offshore wind farms will provide enough power for about one and a half million homes by 2030 and 25 million homes by 2045. That is a Herculean task, and no such projects are in the works yet. Planning, permitting, construction can take at least seven to eight years per project, and you have to also build the transmission to facilitate those projects. The state's ambitious offshore wind targets would add between two and five gigawatts of offshore wind of the coast by 2030, and 25 gigawatts, as mentioned, by 2045. So far, 43 companies have leased 583 square miles in five areas off of Morro Bay and Humboldt County. These deep ocean waters have the potential to produce more than four and a half gigawatts, enough to power one and a half million homes. Thankfully, coastal winds are strongest in the late afternoon and evening when we need it the most. That's when solar power is diminishing. And this fortuitous match means we can balance the state's solar generation with renewable wind energy instead of running gas plants, most of which are in communities already impacted by pollution. And as we heard on the previous panel, there's a lot of hurt already going on in those communities. All of these initiatives have environmental and EJ impacts. Navigating them in our state will be a monumental task. I don't know, we have too much choice. We're gonna to have to develop almost everything that we can in order to meet our goals. Um, we have an excellent panel with which to discuss these matters today. I'm going to just say a brief thing about them in order of uh, their presentations. We're going to lead off with Amber Hewitt of the National Wildlife Federation. Amber is the program director for the Offshore Wind Energy Project. Steve Black, uh, founder and president of Steve Black Strategies. Um, in another life, Steve was a former counselor to Interior Secretary Ken Salazar, and Steve's work has really been critical for California getting off the mark with solar power. Um, Craig Tucker is to join us, I hope. Uh, he's a partner at Lost Coast Wind. Craig works with tribal governments, mainly in the northern part of the state. 
Um, and finally, Lucas Sucker, who's co-executive director of the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy or Cause. Um, we're going to reserve some time to answer questions at the end of the panel discussion. So I'm going to urge you to please use the Q&A functions for the meeting to submit questions. Um, let's begin. Uh, Amber, take it away. Thanks so much, Carl. It's great to be here. I, I really appreciate the invitation. My name is Amber Hewitt, and I am the Offshore Wind Energy Program Director with the National Wildlife Federation. I am based in Massachusetts, and our, our program is national in scope, and PCL is our state affiliate, so really appreciate the chance to be here and speak with you all today. And I will share a bit about our program and why the National Wildlife Federation has prioritized uh, advocating for the responsible development of offshore wind power and the conditions that we apply to that. And I'll share largely or or in large part, I should say, uh, lessons learned from the East Coast since our, most of our work has to date been, been uh, in the Atlantic. But we'll I'll talk a bit about California as well before turning it over to, to uh, those others on this panel. So I'm going to share my screen here and have a few slides to share with you. Right. Go. Okay. Does that look good? Can you see my slides, Carl? Full yes, screen? Okay. looks good. All right. So as I mentioned, National Wildlife Federation uh, has this program at, in, at a national scope, but we really started about 10 years ago in the Northeast region where offshore wind was just starting to uh, gain some traction in New England, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New York in particular had uh, express some interest in, in pilot projects. The Obama administration was uh, making lease areas available in federal waters. And uh, we felt as National Wildlife Federation, uh, and particularly in our Northeast office, that this was an excellent uh, potential opportunity to support a clean energy solution, a climate solution of really game-changing scale. And particularly, I'm born and raised in Massachusetts. So I had been hearing about offshore wind my entire life, didn't really understand why it never took off. We've been trying to trying to get ourselves on the map here for truly about 30 years since, since the industry started in Europe. And it really was, particularly at that point, point a real lack of political will um, and some obstacles around specific projects in the beginning that kind of got us off to a rough start. And so uh, at that time, it really felt like a you know an opportunity for advocacy. It also, uh, as a wildlife organization, came with concerns on our part that that if if this isn't done right, it could have really significant impacts on wildlife and habitat. So we wanted to be at the table advocating for the success of this industry, and um, our definition of success includes protecting wildlife and habitat every step of the way. So we bring that to uh, as a condition to all of our work and our advocacy uh, in this space. So as a very quick Recap, for those of you newer to offshore wind, this is a booming global industry. There are more than 6,000, probably 7,000 now. They're uh, you know, under construction all the time uh, around the world. And at this point still today, the United States only has seven offshore wind turbines in our waters. So the two on the left side of your screen are in state waters off of Rhode Island, or excuse me, the two on the left side of your screen are in federal waters off of Virginia, and the five on the right are in state waters off of Rhode Island. So that's it. This is the entire United States offshore wind fleet, despite all of the progress that we've made um, on paper at state and federal levels in leasing and permitting and contracting and setting ambitious goals. Uh, this is the extent of steel in the water. And so we have a very long way to go. And if you're just coming to the table, there's still a lot of space and time to, uh, to influence what this industry looks like in the United States. The I mentioned that our work started in the Northeast region, and that's largely because of a few conditions that really stacked up to make the East Coast um, the, the place that made sense for the United States to first pursue offshore wind. As you can see, the map that you're looking at de depicts wind speeds across the country, both on and offshore. I like sharing this image because it conveys that the speeds off the coast, off of the, both the East and West Coast, really parallel that kind of consistent strong wind speed that we see in the middle of the country, just to sort of help answer the question of why do we need to go offshore uh, in coastal states? Well, we certainly have, have ample land-based wind resource. We never try to you know, pit one clean energy resource against another. Um, the, it really pales in comparison to what is available 
offshore, the speed and strength and consistency of the wind that is that is blowing um, off our coasts is really just an enormous amount of local renewable megawatts that we um, are just letting pass us by for, for decades now since this industry first got started in the early 90s. The, the the other conditions that really set the East Coast apart, though, were that the um, the water is is shallow, and therefore uh, our outer continental shelf out here is suitable for fixed foundations that need to be installed into the sea floor and floating foundations, which is what you're you're all hearing about on the West Coast, and what needs to be in play in the deeper waters off of California as well as in the Gulf of Maine. It, it was technology that's just a little further behind. So now there are pilot projects for floating wind in Scotland and Japan and elsewhere around the world. Um, and it's really it's really time for for uh, this this chapter of the offshore wind industry to to take off. But that sort of um, gives you a picture of the the difference in in timing uh, from one coast to the other. In the beginning of the Biden administration's uh, first term here is really where we saw a federal goal um, come on the map for a first time. And it's what, uh, for us at National Wildlife Federation, really brought our attention to the West Coast as well as the Gulf of Mexico um, and, our, and our decision to really nationalize our offshore wind advocacy. In March of 2021, we saw the Biden administration for the first time set a, a, an offshore wind time-bound megawatt goal of 30 gigawatts by 2030, with, which came with a whole bunch of commitments across uh, several departments of the federal government. And then they followed up on that just, uh, just a few months ago by adding this specific floating wind goal of 15 gigawatts by 2035. So that really um, set a clear signal that the ambition that the that we're seeing now nationally includes developing off of California, the Gulf of Maine, maybe deep water in the Atlantic further offshore, but that floating is a specific endeavor that this administration is taking on. And that's really an opportunity for uh, not just national, but global leadership, because the floating offshore wind industry is more nascent around the world. And so this, this commitment to investing and driving down the cost of the technology and research uh, around how, how to do it best, it's a real opportunity for the U.S. to put itself on the map uh, as, as in a leadership role as we take this on. So what we also got from the Biden administration uh, that sent more attention and is probably a large part of why you're hearing so much more about offshore wind in California in the past couple of years uh, is, is that they rolled out uh, this map of near-term lease sales uh, that the administration intends to take uh, to hold within within this first term. So we're, we're, of course, halfway through the term and therefore about halfway through meeting the goal uh, laid out on this map. Each of the colorful dots on the screen indicate where the Biden administration wants to hold a lease sale or has already now, two years in, held a lease sale for new wind energy areas in this first term. Well, you can also see on the screen if you if you probably lean closer and and um, maybe pull up a magnifying glass. There are some <laughs> red red shapes uh, closer to the east coast, and uh, those indicate the already leased areas that had been leased under mostly the Obama administration. There was one one under Trump, but. Um, that's the extent of existing lease areas in U.S. waters. And so these um, these new colorful dots and the timeline laid out at the bottom really uh, sets the, set a clear signal of where the administration was looking to advance leasing in federal waters. And you can see the, uh, let's see what color, the orange bar uh, at the bottom indicated the timeline for those Morrow Bay and Humble lease auctions to take place uh, before the end of 2022. So they were just teeny bit behind, but really uh, sticking fairly, fairly close to how this timeline was laid out with that auction taking place just at the end of last year. So that brings us now in California to this, this uh, in from the leasing process into now uh, the permitting process for projects to be able to earn their federal permits and move forward. So this um, timeline lays out the various uh, leasing and permitting processes that developers will now have to go through uh, to be able to to advance projects in the areas that they just just uh, won their leases for. So along the bottom of the screen, you can see the auction gavel uh, that indicates really where we are now, just on the just on the right hand side of that. So those two are the well the two different geographies, the, the five areas off, uh, off of California 
um, are now heading into this survey and planning and site assessment phase of the process, federally speaking. Um, and so this amount of progress and the pace at which it's happening for uh, me personally, as an offshore wind enthusiast, it's really exciting. I've been doing this work for 10 years and I'm thrilled to see some real uh, concerted effort and ambition and real attention to detail and to the, the, the qualitative um, criteria that we care about. Uh, that said, with such pace and scale, this level of ambition brings a lot of challenges. It brings a lot of opportunity and uh, we'll talk about that as well, but I want to just underscore for anyone who is feeling overwhelmed or skeptical or feels like this train is just charging out of the station, it's fair to feel that way. Uh, it's a lot that's happening fairly quickly, despite despite decades of, of, of runway leading up to it, the pace has definitely quickened. So if it feels that way, that's that's a legitimate feeling to have. And the, the pace and scale presents the challenges of things like all of the uh, details around wildlife protection and the, the, the protective measures and requirements that we want developers to have to meet, gathering data and doing a really thorough review of avoidance and mitigation plans, et cetera, that takes time. And to have to rush through that process of gathering baseline data and advising and evaluating mitigation plans, uh, it's tough to rush, rush that. So just acknowledging that. Similarly with workforce and the supply chain, uh, because this is a new industry to the U.S., we aren't equipped to manufacture these pro the uh, offshore wind turbines at the scale that they are built offshore. They're much larger than what we see on land. And so that requires the need to invest in domestic manufacturing training a workforce in the U.S. that can install these turbines, let alone uh, our lack of wind turbine installation vessels. Uh, the list goes on and on and the need to really stand up an industry so that we, um, on an economic level, get the most out of uh, such an enormous endeavor. Uh, that's that's the, the groundwork hasn't really been laid for this to, to launch off of a solid foundation. So there's definitely a need to build the plane as we fly it here. And then finally, Critically important, I know we'll talk about this more later on in the panel, but community engagement is, of course, and building trust in the places that will be most impacted by offshore wind development, really not something that can be rushed. Getting folks input and making sure that it actually informs and shapes what offshore wind um, manufacturing facilities, port facilities, marshalling ports, what, what these things look like, how they impact a community really can't be glossed over or sugarcoated. Of course, it's a, an important transition to clean energy and it's it's ideally going to be so much better than the energy choices of our past. We can't pretend that there won't be impacts to the communities that are going to be closest to this advancement. And so making sure that we take the time to hear folks out and um, and that the input of those most impacted really shapes and informs um, this industry going forward is, is something that's, I think, feeling the squeeze of this pace and scale. So the challenges ahead of us are great. Uh, that said, we're still at the, I think, in, at a point in time where we can see that as an opportunity to really um, take this on together across communities and across the nation uh, to, to hopefully get this right and learn as we go and not, um, not be set back by stumbles and failures, but hopefully to use them to inform and improve projects going forward. I'll, I'll spend just a couple of minutes here on the wildlife impacts, given that I am speaking to you from the National Wildlife Federation, and this is where we spend the most of our time. Uh, and the, the impacts of offshore wind development to wildlife are multifaceted. We are largely concerned with underwater noise, the sound of construction activity. Um, and this is the underwater noise concern mostly falls within the, the surveying and construction phase. Uh, not necessarily once the projects are up and running, though there is certainly a, a noise impact after that stage as well. So underwater noise and how uh, marine wildlife interact with that. The, the a, a large, a really significant challenge on the East Coast has been the risk of vessel strikes, given our the presence of endangered whales off of the Atlantic coast and that they migrate through all of the areas slated for offshore wind development. And so... Um, things like regulating the time of year that vessels can be transiting to and from projects or, or within projects at, at what speed, setting seasonal vessel speed restrictions, things like that. It's just an ongoing challenge, adding more boats to the water when it's already a really dangerous place to be for endangered marine mammals and for sea turtles. 
um, is something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. I know there's been some success on the West Coast at setting vessel speed restrictions for offshore wind development. So um, there's there's real opportunity here to get this right, but it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. And then finally, uh, collision risk once a project is up and running, the, the collision of the actual turbine for birds and bats is, is something that we are always uh, learning about and trying to inform both in the siting process in terms of like where projects are sited, when they can be operating, whether they need to be curtailed at certain times of peak migration for uh, migratory birds, and if there are things that can be done to deter birds from interacting with the turbines. Um, all all issues that we're grappling with. With all of these, um, with everything that I just mentioned, we interact with them or consider those impacts at all stages of development from siting to the choosing the right location and making sure that at that phase, we go take the first step in the mitigation hierarchy approach that you see on your screen here, which is to avoid. So ideally we're choosing places that avoid sensitive um, areas that are that are critical to wildlife and, and, and that um, at least in this early stage, I say this with um, with some some caveat, right? Like we're we're at the, a point where we're starting with some low hanging fruit in the areas that can be of least impact. This will get harder as we go forward to avoid critical um, wildlife habitat areas, uh, and then throughout all the way through to decommissioning. So construction, operations, and maintenance all have varying degrees of impact, and then finally. Um, ensuring that projects have decommissioning plans or at least commitments to establishing decommission uh, responsible decommissioning plans once they get to that phase in their project. So it's really a full spectrum um, approach to minimizing the impact of, of this industry on wildlife. We bring our asks, the those that were sort of teased on the screen before, uh, among many, many others, we bring them at the state, federal, and industry level. So the federal level is really throughout that leasing and permitting process that I uh, had the rainbow bar on your screen that identifies um, several public comment opportunities to add are based on expert input on a specific lease area. What we know about how wildlife interact with that area will provide guidance to the federal government on ways that um, a project should be regulated to meet the needs of being able to coexist with the wildlife that use that area or pass through it. Uh, so since most of these projects will are or will be in federal waters, uh, the federal government is is our first stop to hopefully just, you know, get stringent regulation in place to that is specific to the needs of that area or project site. But we also bring these asks at the state level. A lot of the work that I've done over my 10 years at National Wildlife Federation has been around state policy, reminding states of their power as the buyers of this energy, they're often the ones procuring the power and therefore can set their own parameters uh, for areas where the federal government may fall short of asking for everything that's needed to protect wildlife or every kind of research or monitoring technology that we want to uh, utilize or trial in an area, things like that. That's where the state can really come in and kind of add some fine tuning to wildlife protection based on state expertise and just stakeholder concern at the state level, whether that's layering asks into procurement policy, into an offshore wind master plan that a stand, uh, state may be standing up as is, as is currently underway in California. Uh, and then finally, uh, Excuse me, just a second, Amber. Um, if you could wrap up pretty quickly so we can have time for the other panelists too. Um, I'm on you. my just second to last slide, I believe. So yes, I'll wrap right up. Thank you. And then finally, at the industry level, um, we bring uh, our asks directly to developers in the hopes that they will go above and beyond what's required of them so that we can, for, um, you know, celebrate the the wins that in just industry can bring uh, maybe experimentally or at a trial phase to uh, better to get this industry off to a really strong and, and hopefully successful start. So as my final slide, and this is uh, certainly a sample that I hope folks will uh, want to talk about more at a later time, but um, just in, given that I know there's a lot of state um, state advocates in the audience, likely the, the, the track that I mentioned around just the bringing this advocacy to states, whether it's legislators or or you know governors' offices, um, we have some examples of success in East Coast states of getting these 
um, additional layers of protection on top of federal requirements, whether it's requiring developers to contribute a certain dollar amount to research and monitoring, requiring them to, to submit their mitigation plans to the state earlier than they're required to for federal permitting, um, or just standing up stakeholder groups that evaluate those plans. Um, we've had some great success in the East Coast that I hope that we can uh, bring to be helpful uh, on the West Coast. So with that, I will I will wrap up and turn it over. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Amber. Uh, it's very clear we need to do many things. We need to do them well. We need to do them fast. Uh, and we've got a lot on our plate. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, next up is Steve Black, who I introduced a minute ago. Um, Steve is in his post as uh, Secretary, Counselor to Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, um, helped streamline the permitting of some, some renewables. And he didn't do this by cutting any corners. He did it by aligning state and federal policies. Um, it was a breakthrough. It's the first time that it had been done in California, and it shaved years off the permitting process. So there is a way to do this with offshore wind as well. We can lay the state policies and the federal policies down side by side, do some things uh, together at the same time. And the things that are different, um, be able to do them as quickly and efficiently as we can. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Steve. Um, Steve is now working to advise industries about how to do offshore wind right, and um, he's got a lot of experience and insights for you. Steve? Thank you, Carl. Can you hear me okay? Just yes. sound check? All right. Amber, thank you for that great overview. Um, really an excellent presentation, and I don't have slides, so I appreciate yours <laughs> uh, for providing that sort of organizational context. Um, and you reminded me that I was in the Senate when we passed the Energy Policy Act of 05, which gave the Department of the Interior the authority to permit offshore wind for the first time. Um, it used to be at FERC, and, and it's been a long time coming. <laughs> so um, I share the, the sentiment that although we've been working at this for a long time, things are picking up finally. Really appreciate uh, Governor Newsom's leadership and President Biden's leadership putting the spotlight on California and the opportunity for floating offshore wind off the West Coast. Howard, thank you, and, and Carl, thank you for the invitation um, to participate on this panel today. So I, my name is Steve Black. As, how, as Carl said, I, I was a counselor to Secretary Salazar during the Obama administration, and most relevant to today's conversation, partnered with Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Brown and their, their staffs to create what I think was a very successful state and federal partnership that, that provided a framework through executive orders and MOU, various task forces, to address the challenges of permitting large clean energy infrastructure on public lands and to do it in a responsible way. Um, I think we were successful. And, you know, by example, we permitted about 13 gigawatts of onshore wind and solar in the California desert during the, the Great Recession when we had ARA deadlines. We had very specific and, and binding deadlines for developers to take advantage of treasury grants, loan guarantees, to be able to invest billions of dollars in California. And that that kind of urgency that those statutory deadlines drove Governor Schwarzenegger and then Governor Brown to really focus on the state federal partnership and the, the work that would be necessary to site utility scale projects in what is an equally sensitive eco ecosystem, the Mojave Desert, in a responsible way. And as Carl said, we did not cut corners. Uh, we made, we emphasized the importance of the mitigation hierarchy that Amber referred to avoid, minimize, and mitigate. And there was a lot of work and a lot of good science that informed the siting and permitting decisions at that time. And I think the same is true or will be true in California for offshore wind. I, I wanna make two overarching points uh, at the beginning and then four, I'm gonna raise four topics as kind of hypotheses that we can talk about uh, on this panel. And I welcome your questions. The, the two points are these. Um, 
you know, there is an enormous opportunity here. California can benefit from about $100 billion of potential investments in port infrastructure, transmission, direct manufacturing, good, which will create good, well-paying jobs for hundreds uh, and thousands, literally, of people and benefits for local communities, including uh, the, uh, you know, Lucas is going to speak to this, I think, and Craig will as well. Happily, Bohm adopted what is called a multi-factor auction that includes bid credits and for direct investment in local communities. And, and the offshore wind industry is committed to ensuring that the benefits of development of offshore wind are, are shared equitably with the communities who are most affected. And that includes a sustainable commercial fishing industry. And we can talk more about that. Um, so there's a huge opportunity here, but as Carl said, and as Amber alluded to, there are a lot of challenges. Um, and the second point I'll, I'll make at the outset is, is with reference to the, the title of the panel. <laughs> you know, asking whether California can responsibly develop offshore wind is a bit like the question, can California responsibly develop utility scale renewables in the desert? And of course, the answer depends on who you're talking to. Uh, but I want to... I want to emphasize on behalf of the entire industry, all of the developers that I know and have worked with for the last six years or seven years now in California are committed to the proposition that, that offshore wind can and will be developed in a way that is protective of marine mammals, wildlife, habitat, shorebirds, offshore birds. And as evidence of that, I, I will refer to the Coastal Commission hearings last year where the industry supported unanimously the conditions that the Coastal Commission staff included in their report that led to the unanimous consistency determination under the Coastal Zone Management Act, which was a prerequisite to the BOEM auction and lease sale last December. And I encourage you to look at those staff reports, look at the testimony, look at the comments from the commissioners, that, that occurred at the hearings last year, again, those were, those were the first approvals required by the state of California for the BOEM lease sale. The conditions were extensive and the, and the industry unanimously supported the Coastal Commission staff report and consistency and the conditions for the consistency determination. So I think we're off to a good start and, and with that, I want to turn to a theme that I, that I hope we can talk about during the Q&A, which is the opportunity and the importance of working together to achieve our common objectives. California is trying to mitigate the impacts of a climate crisis. We need clean energy. Carbon-free energy requires new infrastructure. As Carl said, we need to build stuff <laughs> to mitigate the impacts of climate change. We need new generation capacity to meet existing statutory requirements under, under SB 100. We need to work together. And I think there's plenty of opportunity and plenty of common ground for all relevant stakeholders. Uh, but, but I'm referring specifically now to, to protection of wildlife, much like we did during the Obama administration where the solar industry partnered with industry and formed a working group to develop joint recommendations, I think we can do the same today. And I think we have a lot to learn, Amber, from your experience on the East Coast, but I'm referring to the NGO community writ large and more broadly in California, we've had a great working relationship to, to this point, um, but there's a lot of work ahead. And I think as we, as we start to deal with the challenges of permitting 25 gigawatts of offshore wind, in a responsible way in California by 2045, the industry and the environmental NGO community, the environmental justice community, tribes, local communities all need to work together to ensure we do this in the right way. So with that, four propositions for, for your consideration and discussion. One, California needs offshore wind to meet its clean energy and climate goals reliably and at the least cost. I'll come back to that. Number two, California needs to plan and establish the right policies to achieve success. AB 525, Assemblymember Chu's bill, gives us a good start, uh, but I'll come back to that because there's still some policy that we will need to be successful. 
Number three, and I've alluded to this, California needs an effective partnership with the federal government to achieve its offshore wind goals. There is a window of opportunity right now with the Biden administration um, that, that we need to take advantage of and, and that will need to continue. And then number four on the point I just made, developers, NGOs, other key stakeholders should work together to achieve our common goals. I think those are the four kind of pillars <laughs> or theses of my answer to the question, can California responsibly develop offshore wind? We need offshore wind to meet our, our energy and climate goals. And, and without getting into the weeds, Carl alluded to this, offshore wind is a high capacity resource. It blows in the afternoon and at night when solar has peaked or declined to zero. It is cheaper than a lot of new battery storage. So it's a, it's a, it adds resource diversity in locations where we need it. Um, and it would just be irresponsible to ignore it. And, and I'll give you just one data point. TNC, the Nature Conservancy, has done a couple of studies called the Power of Place that show the limited number of areas available for utility scale renewable energy generation in the desert. And whether you're looking at the Mojave or you're looking at out of state wind in Wyoming and New Mexico, Yes, we need to consider onshore resources. We need, to, we need to continue to develop those in a responsible way, but they are limited. They're the number of areas where we can develop the kind of scale of renewable energy generation that California needs out of state or in the Mojave Desert are limited. And so given that the number of impacts in the ocean are, can be managed and, and through sea space planning and, and siting decisions uh, can be mitigated, California needs offshore wind. So let's look at this resource. We've been, in, we've been at this for a long time. Very, very pleased to see the Energy Commission adopt the 25 gigawatt by 2045 goal. Um, now we need to do the sea space planning and figure out where that's gonna go. That's terrific, Steve. Um, great job. Do you have a, are you done or? I I'm, thought you I, were ra wrapping up there, I'm sorry. No, no, no. That, that's a fair time check, Carl. <laughs> I'm happy to wrap up. I'll turn this back over to you and then take further, take questions during the Q&A. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, it's, again, the magnitude of this is just, it's just stunning what we need to do. And uh, to get this done in a time that we need is going to take everything we've got. Um, next up on our list is a person, Craig Tucker, who does uh, work with uh, Native American tribes um, and is uh, very experienced. He's been around for a long time doing this kind of stuff and he's now in his own uh, business. So I'm going to just hand it off to you, Craig. Um, trying to shoot for about 15 minutes or so and um, go for it. Thanks, Carl. And uh, I was, I was kind of rushing to get here because I was talking to wind developers here in Humboldt County um, as most of you all know, um, you know, there's the, the bidding process is over. Uh, the developers have been named for Humboldt County, and the community I think here is it's just sort of sinking in uh, what's the, the size of the development. Um, this is going to be redevelopment of the the bay here. It's going to have big implications for Cal Poly Humboldt and educational programs to train this workforce. And, you know, the communities up here on the North Coast, we're really remote, and in a lot of ways, we're proud to be remote, but it means um, assembling all the infrastructure, getting everything here uh, to assemble these windmills, which are going to be really big, uh, is a logistical problem. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years up here working on removing power projects. So I've been working with the Karuk tribe, the Yurok tribe, Hoopa tribe, the Klamath tribes up in Oregon to remove a hydropower project. Uh, it, it'll be the biggest dam removal in the history of the world. It gets started here in a couple of weeks. And as I was realizing I had uh, put myself out of a job by getting dam removal across the finish line, I had to think about, well, what, what's next? And the whole wind energy development came on the horizon here. 
So uh, although I've worked here in Indian country for a long time, I'm, I'm a not a native person myself, but I uh, reached out to my colleagues with the tribes to see, you know, what do you guys think about wind? And, you know, we did have a, a big battle up here on a land-based wind project uh, a couple of years ago. And of course the, the prime site for a, a land-based wind project here was on a windy ridge which was also a prayer site for the Wiat tribe. And so it became a big debate here locally. You know, the folks that are from California know that, you know, communities around Arcata, California tend to be um, progressive. The idea of getting off uh, carbon-based fuel sources and getting into renewables is very popular here, but it created a conundrum between um, sort of environmentalist and folks who are social justice advocates uh, and tribal justice advocates. And in the end, the community, after a lot of debate, we fought back and defeated the proposal to build this land-based wind project because we didn't want um, this transition to carbon-free energy to be on the backs of native people because let's face it, you know, the... <laughs> The fossil fuel industry was built on the backs of native people around the planet, and we can't have uh, the answer to that be more of the same for uh, native people uh, in California or really anywhere else. So I reached out to um, a colleague of mine um, who's currently the vice chairman at the Yurok tribe, and uh, just to sort of gauge the interest and the comfort with offshore wind. And I can remember calling uh, Frankie Myers and saying, hey, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the best place uh, in North America to build a wind farm is right here, just offshore right here. It's, it, you know, it's incredibly windy here. It's a great wind resource. Uh, that's really want to build these windmills. And this was a, about a week after Patrick's Point State Park was rebranded Sumeg Village State Park. Uh, and the Yurok tribe entered into a co-management agreement with the state of California to manage the state park, which is built on a Yurok village site. And, you know, Frankie says, well, what do you think Sumeg means? And I'm like, I, I, I guess I don't know. He's like, it means the place that's windy as hell. So, so like tribal people here already knew that, that this was the place for wind resources. And, you know, once again, you know, uh, native languages and traditional ecological knowledge was ahead of the rest of us in identifying this. But the conversation, as we talked about it, um, you know, this industry promises a lot. Uh, it promises, you know, energy independence, economic opportunity, living wage jobs. And a lot of those promises for Native Americans sound just like the promises that folks who brought the gold rush were, were promising or folks who brought the timber rush to our region promised or people who brought the marijuana rush to this region promised. And so there's a little bit of that uh, in Indian country of, um, yeah, we, we've heard all this before. So, so how can this be different? And, and I will note it, it, it did not escape the, the attention of the tribes we work with you know, th this is an industry that talks a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, uh, and social justice as part of it. But one of the first big offshore projects built on the East Coast was branded the Mayflower Project. And if you wanted to come up with something that insulted every Native American in the country, that would be what you would name your project, would be the Mayflower Project. So I think that tells me that th this industry has a long way to go to really understand um, these issues of social justice and the issues of, of uh, Native America. But we want to help with that. And I think this can be different, and here's how. Today, uh, tribes have the, the capacity to engage with these companies as business partners in a way that they uh, didn't, you know, back in the gold rush or the timber rush and these other things. So if this industry really wants to be transformative to um, the way we make energy, uh, to really help us dig us out of this hole we've dug ourselves into with global warming, the, they really need to walk that talk by partnering with tribes 
and tribes have the capacity to be equity partners and joint venture partners in wind development. Tribes have capacity to help develop the job training programs and the workforce that goes into wind energy development. Tribes, who better to be participating in the environmental monitoring and mitigation measures than tribes who have been in this place for millennia uh, and understand the environment better than um, anybody else. So one of the things my partners and I, we formed a business called Lost Coast Wind. And we're really trying to play that role of helping broker those relationships between developers. And a lot of these companies are from Europe and are probably unfamiliar with working in a, with Native Americans and tribes. And certainly up here on the North Coast, you know, our congressional districts has more tribes in it than any congressional district in America. And so it's a really unique uh, kind of place because of that. And so we're trying to help these companies enter into these communities and understand that um, tribes are provide an opportunity for new kinds of partners. And if these companies really want to be leaders in um, you know, changing our economy and uh, changing um, the way we power our economy, they also need to change the way that we work with Native America and, and lead on that front too. So that's the role we play. Uh, we are very interested in these conversations. We do support um, renewable energy. We, we, we do view offshore wind as part of that mix that's necessary, but we want to make sure that it comes with, when they talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, they really understand what those terms mean. And they really do um, kind of walk that talk when it comes to working with local communities and local tribes. So I don't even think I use my whole 15 minutes, which is uncommon for a southerner not to use all the time about it. But I'll, <laughs> bless, I'll apologize. Bless your heart. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Carl. Um, you know, I want to just say that it's terrific, Craig. And the challenge of working with the tribes is a real one. Um, you mentioned equity partnerships as one avenue. And I just wanted to point out, this would not be the first time that a tribe had an equity partnership. I worked on a project called West of Deavers in Southern California, where the tribe did with Southern California Edison have an equity position in the project. Doesn't have to be a very big one to be enormously beneficial. And uh, in, in addition to that, being an equity partner, um, they became the first tribe that is a participating transmission owner with the California Independent System Operator, which I was really delighted to see. So this kind of thing, I think, should be on people's radar screens, developers, as they move forward. It solved a lot of problems for Edison. They didn't have to go around the reservation and spend hundreds of millions of dollars to site their transmission line. They are able to use a corridor and expand on a corridor that already existed that the tribe now controls part of. So um, it's a good point. And I thank you for your work. It's terribly important. We have to have those people at the table early, not late. They're not an afterthought. Um, going to move on to our next speaker right now. We're going to, and I should say, Craig, you weren't on at the beginning, but we're field, going to field questions through the Q&A uh, box. And I'll look through them and sort of curate them when we're ready to go. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Lucas Zucker, co-executive director of the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. Um, I know a little bit about this group because I, I've talked with them before and some other stuff. Um, Lucas's focus and their focus is also on the uh, environmental justice side of this. So I want to give him a chance to, to um, give us his thoughts and... Uh, it's nice to meet you, Lucas. I don't think we've crossed paths before, but uh, um, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Carl. Um, yeah, I'm the, the co-executive director at Cause. We're a social, economic, and environmental justice organization in the, the central coast of California. Um, and do a lot of work, you know, among, among other issues like housing and workers' rights on, on environmental justice, particularly in communities like, like South Oxnard, the west side of Ventura, um, that, you know, deal with all of the kind of compounding pollution impacts of uh, power plants, oil drilling, you know, port shipping, uh, agricultural pesticides and fertilizers. Um, and like a lot of environmental justice organizations, we're used to fighting things. Uh, we're, we're used to uh, stopping the harms that are that are coming into our communities, you know, fighting the 
the largest power plant in the United operator in the United States from building a building another power plant in Oxnard or you know stopping the the largest mining company in the world from building a, a liquefied natural gas terminal. Um, but as as folks have have spoken to here, the, the opportunity with offshore wind is is big um, and you know potential to be really transformational and beneficial to a lot of environmental justice communities, particularly who've been been burdened by the fossil fuel economy. Um, and so it's it's a you know it's a challenge and opportunity for for groups like us to you know be kind of out of our comfort zones and you know working with working with government and working with industry around you know how do we you know, get good things built, um, but also recognize that, you know, all, all energy sources, you know, have impacts and, you know, how do we, uh, you know, avoid and, and mitigate the, the harms as much as possible while maximizing the benefits um, for communities of color, you know, low income and working class communities. Um, so as, as Craig spoke to, you know, our, our communities were, were folks who were not at the table in the, in the building of the fossil fuel economy and the decisions that were made. Um, and really, as a result, got disproportionately stuck with, you know, dirty polluting power plants and, you know, in our neighborhoods, um, you know, often to to the the benefit of, of, you know, other more affluent communities with higher energy use that are that are the ones, you know, using that power. And, um, and I think even structurally in California, you know, under under Warren Alquist, you know, local communities have very little land use, you know, power when it comes to energy projects, you know, of this scale. And um, and so for a lot of those environmental justice communities that have been been overburdened with some of the harmful fossil fuel projects, um, there's you know not only this feeling of harm, but but really just this feeling that you know uh, our voices haven't mattered, that that kind of the democratic process and, and policymaking process hasn't taken us into account. Um, and so I want to talk about maybe a few a few different areas where. Um, I think we're trying to answer the question of what does an equitable offshore wind industry look like and how do we make, you know, the new clean energy economy different from the, the mistakes of the past in the fossil fuel economy. Um, so first, and I think this is, you know, one of the foremost things on the mind of, of you know, EJ communities in, in California is, you know, how do we tie the development of, of renewables at large scale to the shutdown of, of fossil fuel plants in that have been disproportionately located in, in EJ communities. And, and I think for a lot of folks in the industry, they may think, well, kind of this is an inevitability, you get renewables on the grid, and then you don't need as much fossil fuels, and that's great, right? Um, but really, the environmental justice community has, has been through this long enough that, frankly, we don't believe in pinky promises. Um, and, you know, just in our most recent experience the last few years, uh, you know, there, there are three power plants in the community of Oxnard. It's a, you know, 85% people of color community. Um, two of those three plants were supposed to be shut down in 2020. Um, one was shut down, but abandoned with no plans for cleanup, just sitting there, you know, rusting on the city's coast. Um, another has been extended once, is, you know, being talked about very, very likely to be extended again by the, the Newsom administration you know, for, for years to come. Um, and you also see the difference in, you know, these these once through cooling plants that were supposed to be shut down and, you know, community like Oxnard where the plants being extended, you know, in a more affluent community like, you know, Redondo Beach where, you know, they're they're making plans and, you know, it's already been bought for, for redevelopment to, to be shut down, right? Um, and so because this has been, you know, the past for our communities, you know, we we want to see more more than that in the future and, and actual, guarantees of, of targeted retirements of fossil fuel plants in our um, in the, the most pollution overburdened communities in California. Um, second is really looking at the supply chain and you know zero emissions measures that are going to mitigate the, the pollution impacts of the supply chain. Um, I think uh, you know folks not familiar with offshore wind often go immediately to thinking about the turbines in the ocean um, and thinking, well, there's no EJ communities in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? Um, but really the biggest impacts are on shore and where a lot of the infrastructure is going to be built is on shore, um, you know, for manufacturing, for assembly, for transportation, shipping. Um, and portside communities are really some of the most notorious environmental justice in communities in California, from Barrio Logan and San Diego to West Oakland. Um, you know, that's because ports generate a lot of pollution. Um, and, you know, this is this is really some of the, the, the places that have dealt with, you know, environmental injustice and environmental racism for a very long time. Um, and, you know, even when we're, you know, building renewables, uh, you know, that that can involve steel fabrication plants next to elementary schools and, you know, 
diesel trucks driving nonstop through your neighborhood um, to get the the level of infrastructure we're talking about, you know, built at the scale we're talking about, um, you know, can can have some pre pretty serious impacts. And so, um, there's a lot of potential right now to to advance zero emissions, uh, you know, in in those sectors. And uh, we really want to see that, um, particularly in the port side communities that are going to be most most impacted here. Um, third, as we're thinking about community benefits, um, thinking about the the cleanup of uh, of old fossil fuel infrastructure, I think, you know, would be would be something really great to see, especially here in the Central Coast. You know, we've been the heart of the Pacific's offshore oil industry for many, many decades. Um, folks here are very familiar with corporations using LLCs and shell corporations and abuse of the bankruptcy process to, you know, essentially leave our ocean and coast littered with, you know, rusting old oil platforms and gas plants and, you um, and so as you know, if there's going to be a kind of new wave of industrialization of our ocean and coast, you know, that that may be what we need to get to the clean energy economy. Um, but we don't want to see our communities, you know, left with the the old remnants of the fossil fuel economy, which is what's happening now. Um, and, and finally, talking about jobs, um, you know, and I think in terms of labor, you know, industry often kind of thinks around relationship with unions. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, but I think recognizing that um, you know, we want to support quality union jobs, and there has been historically, you know, accessibility issues for communities of color getting into the building trades. And so um, thinking beyond PLAs, I think that's the PLAs is the starting point. That's the minimum. Right. And so, you know, how do you um, require workforce agreements that have, you know, uh, dedicated work hours for pre-apprenticeships, um, for, you know, money for workforce development programs in communities, um, targeted hiring for disadvantaged communities, whether by zip code or by, you know, groups of people like folks, you know, re-entry after being formerly incarcerated, um, you know, and, and I, I want to think of it as, you know, someone is a, is a, you know, kid of a farm worker family, you know, in a, in a poor rural town in the Central Coast, you know, how do they have a shot at, at getting a, a quality long-term job um, in this huge new industry being built in their community? Um, so just wanted to share some of the few, certainly there are, there are a lot of environmental justice organizations in California, and I don't want to speak for everyone, you know, but a few that, you know, for us as someone who's engaging with offshore wind, you know, that we see as the potential, you know, benefits to really be maximized and the, the harms to be mitigated, you know, in order to, to work closely with environmental justice communities and make sure that this new industry, you know, operates in a different way than the mistakes of the past. Thanks, Lucas. Boy, you really put your finger on some of the top issues that we need to be thinking about. Um, dealing with these communities, not as an afterthought, but as projects begin, giving them kind of a voice to be part of that process, as Steve and, and Heather talked about. Um, that's going to be a key, uh, excuse me, I, I meant Amber. Uh, that's going to be a key uh, uh, part of any approach to doing large scale offshore wind projects. Um, I want to give you guys a chance to talk with each other. If you have questions specifically for each other, I want to take a few minutes to do that now and lay some things on the table that we can be thinking about. So uh, who'd like to go first? Nobody. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to say, Heather, uh, Amber, if you've got some uh, thoughts that you'd like to share, you've got a lot of experience under your belt with offshore wind in uh, the Atlantic coast. How much of this kind of thing was done, this outreach to communities, um, this engagement with, um, with impacted communities? Uh, was that part of the conversation there? Yes, I will say another, uh, you know, maybe more accurate way of saying that we have lessons learned is that we've learned from a lot of mistakes. So we have, um, I think, because there have been, you know, now a couple of pilot projects, but also lease areas from um, Massachusetts to North Carolina, every state and, and port community is taking this on in a different way. And so we could talk all day about sort of who's doing it best and who is missing the mark. Um, but engagement of local communities, I think, is, is at this point really understood definitely by advocates and in most of those states that are that are trying to advance offshore wind. Um, it's, it's really integral to moving this forward, particularly because in the sort of learning from mistakes track, we had to learn the hard way that when you don't engage, even the communities that will just receive a small cable landing, 
not necessarily have a substation in their community or a manufacturing site or be staging turbines or towers and blades while they wait to be installed, but even just something that will, once it's all said and done, have no more footprint than a couple of manhole covers, even that can really, um, if a community wasn't engaged along the way, when it just shows up, it can be uh, really troubling to a community because it comes with a lot of implications um, and a lot of misinformation. And so we've seen areas like that derail or delay entire projects. So the message there is just that select boards, um, those you know few votes in a community where fear or confusion or just mis or lack of engagement has has been able to really uh, grow while maybe a developer or a state wasn't paying enough attention to that location uh, and how how a community was feeling. Uh, it can can have a, a really significant impact. We have seen projects delayed years or entirely derailed because of community opposition. So yeah. um, it's essential to a project being being successful. And then of course, just more importantly to, to doing it right and advancing this industry in a way as we heard now from everyone that doesn't repeat the mistakes of, of past energy endeavors. And doing it at a pace we really need if we're gonna hit our goals, because that is you know, an enormous hill to climb. Um, Steve, I wanted to go to you also for a minute to talk about your experience working with developers of wind projects on how they view these kinds of, of issues. Um, and I know that was really important to you and we were working on solar siding in the desert. Um, and I wonder you know, what you've learned from these, these industry players about how they're going to approach this. Thanks, Carl. Uh, it's a really important question. And, you know, I'll just speak from my experience working with my client on the Central Coast. Um, I represented Castle Wind, and Castle was the only developer, uh, to my knowledge, to begin engaging with the local community, you know, back in 2016. And the best evidence of that is a legally binding mutual benefits agreement with the commercial fishermen and, and a community benefits agreement with the city of Morro Bay that we established in 2018. Um, and Lucas, I'd love to, you know, get your advice about how to take the BOEM bid credits now that the auction has occurred. BOEM, unfortunately, and, you know, I can't speak for BOEM, but we, we encouraged BOEM to give bid credits for legally binding agreements before the auction. And instead, what, what BOEM did in the auction design is give credit for promises of future performance. So those promises are now out there. You've got five uh, leaseholders in California that have made promises worth tens of millions of dollars. Now what we need to do is ensure that those promises are fulfilled and, and ensure that they are fulfilled in a way that's equitable and fair and distributes the benefits of offshore wind to the affected communities while avoiding the kinds of impacts that Lucas and Craig are talking about. So Carl, that, that, that agreement with the commercial fishermen, and we don't have a commercial fisherman representative on this panel, but that, that was, we set the bar high. And I think all of the other developers in California and, and perhaps throughout the West Coast will need to meet that bar, not only to satisfy key stakeholders, but to satisfy regulators. I mean, the Coastal Commission has authority under Chapter 3 of the Coastal Act to ensure that environmental impacts of, of development in the coastal zone are mitigated. And that's a good example of that. We modeled our agreement on the cable committee agreements that the telecommunications industry used. Um, so that's just one example, Carl. There are many others. Um, but I completely agree with the point. And my boss, my former boss, used to refer to this as smart from the start. <laughs> Developers need to be engaged with local communities well before submitting an application for a permit. Th these, are, th these are commitments and relationships that are critical to s ultimate success of the project, and they have to happen before a lease application or before a BOEM lease is awarded. Thank you, Steve. Um... Excellent points. Um, I was wondering, uh, 
Lucas, what's your reaction is to what you're hearing here about, is this uh, something that this approach that you're hearing people have taken on the East Coast and are beginning to really integrate into their work on the West Coast, is just sort of hitting the mark for you? What do you think? Yeah, not, not too familiar with, with of course, what's happening in the East Coast, although, uh, you know, one, one shout out I'll give to the East Coast is there was a great uh, kind of offshore wind principles um, a document that was put out by a coalition of organizations out there, I think led by Uprose in New York. Um, and we'd encourage folks to, to go and, and check that out um, for some some kind of big picture principles. Um, yeah, I think as, as Steve spoke to, I mean, you know, getting ahead of those those conversations is, is really important. Um, and this is this is kind of the moment now, right, where where leases have been awarded, right? Um, you know, I know, you know, we had a couple companies kind of reach out to us before leases were awarded. And it's kind of at that stage, it feels a little like, well, I don't even, you know, I don't even know where things are going. I don't, I don't want to, you know, get involved with some some company that, you know, well, now now the leases are here. This is the moment to start, start, you know, talking with communities. And um, I think one of the challenges, one of the biggest environmental justice impacts is kind of around the port side infrastructure. And I think that's a little bit still unclear. And so even, you know, in the Central Coast, particularly like where where the port side infrastructure will be is is very, very uh, open ended right now for for the Morro Bay wind energy area. Um, uh, you know, and, and then I think that it's there are things that can be done through, you know, mitigations or community benefits, you know, directly. You know, I, I mentioned some of the things around, you know. Uh, money for you know cleanup of of kind of you know old fossil fuel you know uh, infrastructure right or or kind of you know jobs benefits for communities uh, you know targeted hiring right um, uh, you know things like that um, and and there's pieces that are are a little bit more going to be have to maybe happen through through kind of the state policy making and the regulatory system like what I mentioned around trying to tie um, you know offshore wind energy to the retirement you know, in targeted communities of, of you know, old, old fossil fuel plants, um, you know, that's maybe not something a, a developer might be directly able to promise, but something that I think developers can, you know, work with communities and the state to, to try to get to happen. Um, yeah, and I then can... I think some of the port stuff may, it may shake out as we, as we get closer to figuring that part out. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that stuff is key. Um, I want to turn to Craig and ask you a couple of questions. Craig, by the way, I worked on the York Indian Reservation in 1983 for nine months doing housing rehab projects, and I lived in Humboldt for 10 years, so I'm very familiar with the area and some of the issues um, around uh, Native American sensibilities. Um, a lot of this is going to be offshore. There is going to be some onshore impacts. Um, and I know the tribes have indicated that, at least the tribes that are engaging so far, which I think the Wiat and the Yurok's are mainly the ones that are engaging on this stuff. Um, how do you characterize some of their key concerns about um, the offshore places where things are going, um, where the lease sales occurred? Um, they seem to be pretty far out. Um, I'm just wondering how that intersects with um, tribal special areas. We also know that commercial fishermen are affected, as we've mentioned before. And there, each one of those commercial fishermen in Humboldt is a small business, um, you know, and they are uh, very worried in some cases about where some of these things will go. Um, what are you hearing? Well, I would um, I would point out that some of the fishermen commercial fishing is in issues are also travel issues because our, our fishing fleet here, there's a lot of native people that are owner operators of fishing boats uh, and who work on fishing boats or have a job in that industry. So there's a kind of relationship there between um, the fishing industry and tribes. The One of the big questions here was, um, they are talking about placing the structures 20 miles offshore. And I think this is, you know, the whole development of the floating technology uh, kind of developed in part because people don't want to go to the seashore and see these things. So there was, I think there's a push on that. And then of course, in California, the continental shelf drops out very quickly. So, um, you know, driving them into the seafloor in some of these places is not an option, but ceremonial practitioners and, and, who, who hiked to prayer seats in the high country, are they gonna look west and see a, a bunch of lights on the horizon 
um, from that, you know, that, that has an impact on practicing traditional religions for folks. So understanding those impacts or those mitigable, uh, we, and I say we, the Yurok tribe uh, led the reintroduction of condor here this past year. I can tell you if the first time a windmill kills a condor, there's going to be a big problem here. So how do we dissect those impacts and understand if that's a, if that's a threat? Um, the, the, the project that's just been approved is starting to bump up against what the Yurok's describe as unceded territory in the ocean. And the, it seems like the next areas to be evaluated for a wind energy site is going to be off the coast of Del Norte County uh, and then further north uh, in Coos Bay, uh, Oregon. So these things, you know, we may see these um, wind energy plants creep all the way up the coast here. Um, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that this is unceded tribal territory, even in the ocean. And you know these companies need to understand what that means and acknowledge uh, that fact in their agreements. Um, yeah, I, I doubt that many of them have even heard of that before. So it's going right. to be some education, <clears throat> excuse me, on our part to them to help them interact and engage with it. We need to build some of these things. We need to build them fast, and we can't, you know, let things that we could avoid by just having mutual understanding, as Steve pointed out, delay these projects. Some of them may have their financing destroyed because they didn't build a project in time. Their investors walk out on them. Yes. And equipment orders that have to be made and the backlog. I think, Steve, you may have mentioned also that there's delays in getting this stuff. Cables just don't fall out of trees right. when you're talking about um, building transmission, for example. So um, this is something where the conversation is going to be important to really have people grasp the main issues. That's why I asked the question that I did is because I don't think some of these things have been fully on the table. And again, if the if the tribes are looking for more of an equity partnership, they need to make that known right away. And I think some of them are doing that. So it's not like they're not. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I was I was actually late to this because one meeting like that was going on here that I was a part of and I couldn't extricate myself of. So so those conversations are happening here. Um, and we do, you know, like I say, there's a, a big diversity of tribes here in Humboldt County uh, and on the North Coast. Uh, and every tribe has its own interests uh, and has a, you know, different needs to be met and a different interest in participating in this process. And so I think it is going to take a while for developers and supply chain folks come to this area and understand um, sort of this ecology of tribes here uh, and how they play different roles, have different, bring different things to the table and will have different demands. And the, the cultural impacts are also variable depending on where the tribes are located and things like that. Yeah, there's another aspect of this we haven't talked about, but it goes to something that I think Lucas was mentioning um, as far as engaging with uh, a plan to close down some of the old fossil plants. Um, for those of us that have been working on offshore wind and transmission issues, that's one of the main reasons we're doing it is because if we don't, we won't be able to shut those plants off. As we electrify the economy more, the demand for electricity grows, but system reliability stresses also increase. And the reason those gas plants continue to run is you can turn them on when everything else isn't working. And it's a reliability thing that, mm -hmm. you know, we have to also understand um, you know, I've been thinking about talking with folks about maybe a hierarchy of which plants we should go after closing first. If you have a choice, pick the ones that are the dirtiest and get them off the table. Um, I think folks are thinking about that, no commitments to actually doing that kind of thing yet, because most of the people who run the grid and are responsible for keeping the lights on really, I think, are justifiably worried about the reliability of the system. Well, and I would plead that you guys not uh, leave hydropower out of that conversation. And I think the conversation gets a lot about carbon and, and air quality and things like that. But we need clean air and clean water uh, to make it work. And so a lot of the, in Northern California, a lot of the plants we need to decommission are hydropower plants. Uh, and so we would urge you guys to include that in terms of uh, thinking about how 
as we get carbon neutral sources like wind online, what are we taking offline? And it's not just uh, coal and gas, but you know the, the worst, uh, the deadbeat dams that we need to get rid of uh, for water quality and fish health. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. We have some questions here that I'd like to turn to and give you guys a chance to respond to. Um, one is from Faramars Nabavi, who I happen to know, um, a very interesting one. He says, the example of tribal stakeholders becoming transmission owners was heartening, a challenge that we face for responsible development of offshore wind is transmission. If each project has to build its own interconnection lines, Will there both be more environmental impacts and higher costs? And uh, and that's for anybody on the panel that would like to uh, discuss that. I have some thoughts also. Well, I'll add, I, I started going to these wind conferences. To, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna become an expert on wind now. And this question came up quite a bit. And I think there's a, a concern about environmental impacts of running the power on shore. And there's also the concern about what's the most cost effective way to, to do this. And as we start building out these, um, these offshore, um, I'll call them offshore power plants, really, can we connect them to one another? And so that, you know, if we're going to build something off of Humboldt, off of Del Norte, off of Coos Bay, maybe they're all connected to one another and it comes on shore once. And so I think the engineers are trying to get creative about how to do things like that. But it's a problem for us because right now, all we can accept in terms of tying into our grid is 150 megawatts. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have to somehow increase our transmission infrastructure in order to run the power on shore or else we're gonna be looking at running the power hundreds of miles through the ocean to someplace south or north of us where you can tie it in. But I think that this, for the for Northern California, the likely the biggest impacts we have to worry about are those associated with running the power on shore and uh, putting it on the grid. Yeah, once it's on the grid, you have to have lines that have the capacity to wheel it. Right. And I think you're right. We're going to see some lines that are proposed to be offshore because they can provide that kind of large scale capacity to get into the system. I wanted to um, turn to Amber to also opine on this because I know on the East Coast, there has been a talk directly to Faramars' question about creating a web of uh, of offshore resources that would tie in in single places so that you didn't have a spaghetti of landing points from different um, projects coming up and down the coast. A good friend of mine, <clears throat> Bob Mitchell, is one of the people who established this idea with something called the Atlantic Wind Connection. Now, um, he was ahead of his time and he didn't get to build a project, but his idea lives. And uh, Amber, can you tell us what the status of that kind of um, approach is? Yeah, yes. I, I think we're, I hope that we're on the cusp of having some useful models on the East Coast. I think you hit the nail on the head there by just noting the, the ch challenge of getting the timing right of, of advancing a, a large scale transmission or planned transmission solution because it's been such piecemeal uh, and fits and starts, right? Like we've been talking about advancing offshore wind for, on the East Coast for decades and we still only have seven turbines. And so getting developers, you know, we started holding lease auctions nationally in 2013 and, and there's still not a, a turbine to show in those lease areas. And so having developers align their timing for running their power ashore and having that be suitable with a transmission plan is really difficult when we're talking about taking on two enormous new endeavors at the same time. There's a lot of, uh, in those earlier days, there was were strong feelings from developers on wanting to be able to, given the abundance of challenges of financing such a project to add in, you don't have control over getting your power ashore. You need to partner with another endeavor. Those timelines need to line up uh, and be permitted on a timeline that's suitable. The fear of stranded assets and, and just the, the number of question marks that would surround something like that really kind of scared this um, uh, conversation ever from really getting getting to a place of, of there being anything to show for it. Uh, that said, now that we have enough uh, enough of a shared vision, enough projects underway in, in close proximity to one another. Um, it, there does seem to be, I think we've come to a place of pretty much consensus that there needs to be a transmission plan 
Um, and there, we've seen as recently as yesterday, right, New England states putting out um, uh, or initiating shared transmission, you know, dockets so that we can start yeah. to gather input. There's been a lot of that, a lot of like shared transmission uh, requests for information. What do you, what are we, what can we do here? New Jersey did a really uh, interesting uh, endeavor at trying to have a, a planned transmission approach and got something like 90 contributions and none of them quite worked. And so uh, there's so much work that's been done here. And I think we're close to figuring something out. But what I will say is that the, um, on an environmental impact standpoint, I, I do try to resist oversimplifying and saying things like, you know, fewer lines are better, a planned transmission strategy is better. I didn't, uh, National Wildlife Federation didn't jump in to support planning transmission versus letting developers do their own transmission lines, because it's really still going to come down to the details, exactly how you site and install a project like this, how you engage the community where it's landing. And these projects are getting so big on their own that they're filling transmission systems themselves. So there's also a technological challenge here of how much are you really gaining by plugging multiple projects into a transmission system when the projects themselves are are gigawatt scale now. So all that to say, there's an abundance of uh, questions, proposals, conversations on the East Coast. I don't think we have a, a perfect case study for you. Yeah, yet. that's that's really true. Um, one of the things that I think we learned um, in the desert is you have to have a regulatory ecosystem, to borrow the term, that'll um, enable the parts to work together. Um, you know, uh, offshore, we really are developing that still. Um, we have to, and and as we did with, with onshore solar resources, have the state and the federal governments, again, work together on the environmental review. A lot of the environmental questions we're discussing right now are going to be exposed and addressed in the, the environmental documents for these plants. Um, so I, I think we have to pay attention to those. But I think as we're getting off the ground and just beginning, we have to also pay attention to this regulatory ecosystem and the partnership between the regulators, which in many cases will include the tribes. Um, Steve, I know being you were an architect of some of this kind of an approach, um, what do you think we could do? Is there anything we could do differently that we need to do for offshore wind? Well, thanks, Carl. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> I on, on transmission, and you're more of an expert on this than I am, but I just want to make two points for the audience. Um, AB 525, which is the state offshore wind planning bill, does require the, the CEC in partnership with other agencies to develop a transmission plan for to meet the 25 gigawatt offshore wind goal. And I would encourage anyone who has an interest to go to the CEC website, look at the open docket, file comments. The, the strategic plan is due in June. And, and relatedly, Carl, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, there's a need and an opportunity, I think, for the state of California to make a policy case for the kind of transmission solution that will deliver 25 gigawatts to the grid, but minimize impacts to tribal resources, cultural resources, environmental resources at the same time. So to the question about sort of consolidating Gentile lines and planning transmission, I think, I think there's a, a case to be made that, that because it is the policy of the state of California to decarbonize its grid and, and encourage resource diversity and therefore add offshore wind to the grid, that, that there is also a policy case that the, that the CPUC and the ISO, the system operator, can use to approve a subsea cable or high voltage transmission that, that brings offshore wind to the grid in a responsible way. Craig, I'm sure your clients would have some real concerns about new greenfield transmission across the Trinity Alps, for example. So okay. we, you know, we need a solution that makes sense for everybody. Yeah. Um, I Take your point there, Steve. One thing that goes along with this is there is sort of a market component to this that actually works in our favor. A lot of times it doesn't, <clears throat> but in this case it really does. Is it's expensive to build right. converter stations. So people, the developers I know, have been working on and thinking about this or identifying just a few onshore places where they would land. If there's an offshore cable um, from Humboldt to be somewhere in the bay. 
um, you're not going to have converter stations all the way down the coast. Similarly, <clears throat> you're going to start with offshore wind off Morrow Bay and off of Diablo Canyon. Well, you have a giant nuclear power plant there that has all this electrical infrastructure and lots of land where you could do that kind of thing and do it in an area that's already been um, uh, environmentally accounted for, shall we say. Um, not everything is going to work and people have to look at these things very, very carefully. And the same thing's true in Los Angeles. There were not, aren't going to be a multitude of cable landings. And this is important because you have two different kinds of utilities in Southern California. You have LADWP, which is a public utility, uh, public, uh, publicly owned utility. And you have Edison and you have SDG&E. So, you know, there's a lot of pieces here and people don't want to pay more than they absolutely need to. So some of this is providing some discipline in the way the scale of in implementation is being envisioned. Um, anybody else have a, a particular thought that here that you can um, throw out that'd be illuminating for us? I don't know how illuminating it is, but uh, I would encourage us to think even even bigger. Um, I think the future, uh, I think power lines are going to go the, the way of telephone lines. Uh, and some of the ideas I've heard that's kind of on the cutting edge into this, it gets me excited, is um, using offshore wind to store energy in the form of fuel cells or advanced battery technologies. So you could envision a future where we didn't have to have all these power lines running all over the place, just like we don't, you know, we, we got rid of phone lines. Uh, I know there's probably people here that can't remember a time when this was attached to a wall, but I remember that time. Uh, but I, so I do think the technology here is still, it's still new and the rate of technological advances in this sector is still picking up sp speed. So I think as they start building these things and, and learning uh, as they go, we're going to find a lot of new technologies and new ways to get to convert wind into energy we can use. Um, but I do think we have to keep the pressure uh, on these companies to force that technology being advanced because it's it need you know necessity is the mother of invention. And so if you need if you if it's necessary to avoid environmental impacts they are going to come up with better and better and cleaner and cleaner technology. Yeah. I see Howard is rejoining us. Do um, you have a comment, Howard? No, just just uh, join at the end here. So I know you have a couple more, uh, a couple people to wrap up. So. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Talked about the cost. Oh, yeah. The, the batteries and the new technologies that you just alluded to, uh, Craig, some of this is starting to happen. We are seeing what they call hybrid projects occurring, where solar farms are adding batteries. This is mainly for a reliability thing. So you can operate several hours into the evening after the plants shut, uh, solar plants are shutting down. Um, but it is, it is an economic opportunity, and the state is betting very big on batteries. Um, the thing we need to keep in mind, and uh, Lucas, I'd like your view on this, is that takes up land too. And the batteries have to be put somewhere. And uh, hopefully uh, putting them in, in impacted communities won't be a first choice. And I don't think it will. It's simply because land is very dear there and very heavily occupied. So you're not going to have a lot of places to go. But you still have to think about it because there are poor communities in the Central Valley and elsewhere in California that there is land around them that could wind up being used for, for uh, battery installations. Um, any thoughts on that, Lucas? Have you guys talked about that in your uh, investigations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, storage is going to be critical, right? But um, yeah, I would say I think there is a real possibility that you know, storage facilities are going to be kind of disproportionately located in, in uh, you know, the same communities where, where you know, fossil fuel power plants were located. Because we're, what we're already seeing is a lot of, you know, kind of peaker plants and things like that being replaced by large-scale battery facilities at the same location, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, there's a convenience for, uh, you know, energy companies to go, well, we've already got land here. We've already got infrastructure. We're taking off this 
you know, gas plant offline, let's, let's stick a, you know, um, you know, stick a battery here. Right. Um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, the reality is communities across the state are going to have to, you know, share some, some burden for batteries, but I think it's totally possible that, that, yeah. you know, just like anything else, the batteries end up disproportionately located. in. Yeah, in that's a good point. I think, you know, we're looking at places where we already have electrical infrastructure. So it makes sense to put them in those places, especially if they're not creating pollution, um, to take advantage of that. So we don't have to go in a greenfield place or disturb someone else's home. Um, so how are we doing on time here, Howard? Are we over? Are we on? We are done. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Right at twelve fifteen. <laughs> well, then I'd like to just take a minute to thank the panel. You guys have been terrific. Um, this is such an exciting area to be engaged in because we really need it. We need to do it well. We need to do it fast, and we need to do it at the same time. We're doing many other things like building transmission. So um, thank you for laying out these various uh, facets of this problem. And Howard, thank you for hosting this. It has been really a fun and interesting uh, time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, Craig, I'm still trying to figure out how to staple this to my wall. So I don't have to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, panelists. I really appreciate it. Amber, Steve, Craig, Lucas, it's been wonderful. Great conversation. This is just the beginning uh, of a very robust and long conversation we're going to be having in California. Um, thank you, Carl, very much for uh, moderating it. That was wonderful. And I really appreciate everyone's time and experience on this. So uh, PCL, along with our national partner, NWF, is we're going to stay at the table on this. Um, this is big. It's big for California. It's big for us setting an example. Um, I really want us as a community and as a state to set this example nationally and globally. Um, I really appreciate Steve's principle that he put forward there. Uh, we have to do this together. And so um, this is just the beginning of that. And, and I think, I feel that PCL and many of our other allies and partner organizations across the state can be really helpful uh, in promoting and, and helping produce that outcome of, of working together on this. So we got to do it, right? We don't have any time. We can't waste any time. Um, as Carl was saying, all of you were saying, but we got to do it together. So thank you very much for joining us today in this last session.